Hi, I'm Sally Windsor. I'm from the Department of Pedagogical Curricula and Professional Studies at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. I'm a geography teacher, a geography educator. I also teach education for sustainable development and global education here in Gothenburg. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, my thoughts on why geography can't be reduced to ESD and ESD can't be reduced to geography and why we need um, to understand that we also, as geographers, can't be alone in teaching ESD. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. And my name is Peter Bagoishimo. I am also former geography teacher, geography educator and um, professor of geography education with Humboldt Universität in Berlin. And I would like today in this presentation to add to what uh, Sally um, already introduced some evidence concerning the contribution of different school subjects to ESD and also zero in on geography in different national contexts, how we actually could tie education for sustainable development to geographical knowledge if we wanted to do that. What are the limitations? What are the good parts? Taking Michael Young's definition of powerful knowledge as subject specific, coherent, conceptual, disciplinary knowledge that will empower students to make decisions and become action competent in a way that will influence their lives positively. I want to argue that although geography is a really great place to host much ESD because of its safe haven, facilitating, validating approach to interdisciplinary environmental research, I want to argue that it can neither be reduced to ESD or alone in teaching about ESD and sustainability issues. Powerful knowledge in all disciplines more broadly is important. Now, Alaric Maud has argued that all disciplines should include sustainability as an evaluative component. And I slightly disagree with this, okay? But I do agree that all school subjects or all school disciplines, the social sciences more broadly and the natural sciences have powerful specialised knowledge that should be included that relates to sustainability specifically. So just as a refresher, ESD arose from this uh, from critiques that traditional environmental education that was based solely in the, the natural sciences could not satisfactorily address the interlinked human and societal issues that preempt or, or so often cause the environmental destruction and proliferation of these environmental issues, such as climate change that we are experiencing at the moment. So the advantage that geography has in talking about sustainability issues is that we as geographers have the ability to link spatial technologies um, and measurements, uh, with, and observations that enable this link between people and the environment. So in response to critiques of traditional environmental education, geography has a really is a really good place to start with teaching about sustainability in all its forms. And here's an example that I just wanted to share with you. This is an example of some images that I used in my uh, Swedish classroom. Uh, earlier in the year. Now you might recognize this, these, some of these images from January of 2020 uh, in the Australian bushfires that saw the start of the Roaring Twenties that we uh, now refer to them as. Um, and why I am showing you these is because if you look at the bottom left-hand corner. This is a map of Sweden where I have managed to 
uh, to overlay the size of the damage or the affected bushfire affected area in Australia over the southern part of Sweden, Swedish, the Swedish country. Now, what is interesting about this is that this shows that the three largest cities in Sweden uh, would have been affected by the, the bushfires. So I was able to use spatial technology for my students here in Sweden to have an understanding or a better understanding of the effects of these environmental issues that were happening on the other side of the world. Now, there are many school subjects or school disciplines that can stake a claim to it interdisciplinarity like we can in geography. But this explicit linking of human and natural systems and the validation of the importance of people, of the people and the environment tradition has a long history in geography. But what is now uh, new and exciting and important uh, and an important responsibility for geography is the, this uh, new spatial technologies that we can measure and use to measure and observe. If we're thinking about going back to this idea of powerful knowledge, um, as Young explained that knowledge is powerful if it predicts and if it explains and if it enables us to envisage alternatives. And he also warns that school subjects are not just light versions of academic disciplines, that there are particular ways of doing things within school uh, academic disciplines that are based on or should be based on notions of powerful knowledge. Now, I want to argue a little bit or question here a little bit young separation of curriculum and knowledge or, or, and uh, pedagogy and ask what does the German or Nordic tradition of didactic do for us when we're thinking about these questions? So the European didactic historically research uh, conducted in this tradition has started from an understanding that there is a dimension to teachers' work where they are independent and have the opportunity to make didactical decisions, okay? The teacher is not understood as implementing blindly a given curriculum or a, as in, you know, a curriculum tradition, but what they are considered to do is play an important part in enacting the powerful, powerful knowledge within the curriculum. Um, so it's not just a matter of principles, but teachers and students are considered to, to be an important part of this. And in this sense, the work of the teacher becomes defined as an interpreting activity. But Interpretation doesn't just happen in a vacuum. And that's why geography can't be reduced to ESD powerful knowledge or alone in teaching about sustainability. So, I mean, obviously a curriculum is influenced by policy, um, but it's also influenced by traditions of teaching that are expressed in different ways of teaching, different teaching activities, different types of uh, artifacts or resources that are used in teaching um, and the public view of the subject. Uh, and what, how, how things are expected to be organized. So all of these aspects influence the transformation process in uh, this idea of didactic. And here we see another few pictures of how 
the, these curriculum ideas directly related to sustainability um, are enacted, okay? And what we can see here is some, the enactment of some powerful knowledge related to urban sustainability in this case, history, the values of, of parks, caring and monitoring for growing natural environments, uh, inquiry activities that link to the local uh, environment, big ideas or values such as social justice, democratic processes, and ecolo ecological sustainability, which are all very important, I think, in, in geography and but more broadly as well. So we might not be able to know the future. Um, and as teachers, perhaps without too much sustainability education ourselves, what's our ethical responsibility to teach sustainability? Um, what we what we do know is that teachers can foster learning that build our students' ethical competence and capacities for thinking and acting in ways that create a more sustainable future. I mean, one of the reasons that I think we geographers or we geography teachers cannot be alone in teaching about sustainability is that because we don't hold all the powerful knowledge that is necessary to address this. So perhaps we don't have this um, education in sustainability ourselves. We haven't had this, but we do have an ethical responsibility to teach about these issues, even if we don't hold the powerful knowledge ourselves. So, we might not be able to know the future, and but what we can know and what we can do is we can foster learning that builds our students' ethical competence and capacities uh, and ways of thinking and acting um, that create a more sustainable future. When we think about the more expanded definition of ESD, as it is integrated across school subjects and appears in school curricular documents, we are required to become engaged in sustained ethical practices to teach, the, teach about these concepts. So as Strike argued, it's more important to keep in mind it is difficult to represent moral concepts that are highly important in the practice of teaching in the curriculum for teachers. And this is where I think we can't expect powerful knowledge to be held for sustainability in one area. So how do we do this? Now, Ariane Walls would argue uh, that the role of education is to, education for sustainability with regards to our environment, is to create capacities for critical engagement in the key issues of our time. And he would say that these, these capacities include anticipatory thinking, integrative thinking, dealing with complexity and ambiguity. And we have a responsibility as teachers to create learning spaces for the development of qualities such as care, empathy, and solidarity. And there are a number of ways that we can go about doing this as teachers. So there's this idea that is um, of transformative learning that is very important within uh, all, um, all school subjects. And this is the type of learning that um, it enables us to recognise and modify the assumptions and beliefs that frame our tacit points of view and influence our understandings, our values and interpretation of the world, but also and importantly of others and ourselves. And that was Jack Mesero that has been uh, theorised this idea of transformative learning. 
when we're thinking about um, this idea of didactic, um, Nicholas Garrick and colleagues from Karlstad's University here in Sweden take a, a slightly different idea of transformation or transformative learning. And they uh, describe a transformation as a process of interpretation and, and interpretation takes into consideration this idea of enactment and in, uh, didactization of disciplinary knowledge. That is how it is transformed into something that is teachable and relevant for students. We've also got this idea of transgressive learning. Now, presently, what we do in schools and in the social sciences, in education more generally, is almost exclusively viewed as serving the economy, okay? And it, the powerful knowledge that is neglected is that knowledge that adequately values the Earth's resources, the human and the non-human world. And so the idea of transgressive learning <clears throat> is that that asks us to consider the structural elements that drive much of what we do in education and provides a space for critical thinking, civic action, and debate in our classrooms. What we must do as educators is we must provide more than just spaces for critical pedagogies, but we also must provide support for young people to fully participate in civic life. So Michael Young, I heard in an interview uh, earlier in 2020, uh, explained that we should start with the assumption of schooling in that it should focus on the disciplinary, disciplinary specialised knowledge that gives the basis for then becoming transdisciplinary. And it's important to see that others have specialised knowledge too. And this is very much what I agree with. I agree that teachers of all discipline hold powerful specialised knowledge and powerful didactical knowledge. And that what we need is a way of thinking about the world in such terms that we cultivate the art of keeping in mind what we leave out. And here is where I'd like to finish. I think it's important to recognise our limitations as geographers. We are a great bunch, but we don't hold all the powerful knowledge or all the powerful didactical knowledge. And I think this is a really nice quote to finish on. Thank you. So let's go a bit deeper into the interconnectedness between subject specific knowledge and education for sustainable development. And the good way to start is to look at the claims and what I call the great expectations connected to education for sustainable development. As this slide shows the view of uh, the German UNESCO committee was to implement education for sustainable development into all areas of education relevant for all age groups into all kinds of normative documents of the educational system. And in the case of secondary education, for example, both cross-curricularly and into the individual subjects. And very important on this slide is that in the case of secondary education, the document speaks of the implementation of ESD topics. So specific topics, not just the concept of sustainable development into the individual subjects. Now, many of you might find these expectations somehow ambitious, and indeed they have proven to be such at the end of the UNESCO United Nations Decade um, of Education for Sustainable Development. But more importantly, such expectations of a cross-curricular objective 
of which many of us have experienced over the years entering the curriculum and leaving the curriculum, they remind us of, um, or at least me, they remind me of the work of Bill Marston, who, based on a historical study of English curricula, established three dimensions or three elements of, of a curriculum in its architecture, namely the subject component, the educational component, which we might call pedagogies or didactics, depending on where we work and what traditions we follow, and the so-called social education component, which uh, Marston labeled as contemporary good cause. All these adjectival educations, for example, environmental education, intercultural education, education for sustainable de development for that matter. And while Sally mentioned the necessity of addressing such aspects as well, and we all know that a society's informal education, of course, um, address this dimension of the social education component for our issue here becomes important to to explore what happens when this turns into this so how much place such uh, cross-curricular objectives should occupy in the curriculum and at what expense and this visualization to a certain extent unites the debate the two strands of debate that I repeatedly observed in the community of geography educators as well. On the one hand, those who in this Turquois development see a loss of disciplinary identity and lack the subject component, whereas the others say that this is not the case. We continue being on the left-hand side because sustainable development actually is the core of geographical knowledge. So let's take a look into this debate that has been so crucial for us in the community of geography educators. And allow me the exercise, please, to, to make the messy and very complex work, world into to reduce it to a simple dichotomy in the situation, namely sustainable development versus disciplinary knowledge. Now, I know that there are different views on this, but please bear with me for the, for the sake of this exercise. And let's explore some of the elements of this dichotomy. Now, there are many ways to, to explore such interrelations between two uh, elements, such as um, disciplinary knowledge and the sustainable development. The most straightforward and the most extensively discussed one of all these is obviously the debate revolving around the concept of sustainable development. And while many of us consider a multitude of conceptualizations uh, as, as an indicator of a vivid academic discourse and an extremely welcome thing, a number of stakeholders in the educational process um, are seeking out clear answers and specific so so-called clarified definitions and the right definition, which in the case of sustainable development to a certain extent applies, but not really necessarily. Just a brief um, glimpse at the multitude of conceptualizations that are possible. In this case, for example, the very particular German division of reality into economy, ecology, and the social, or the, the Spanish speaking perspectives in a huge variety across Latin America as well of desarrollo sostenible, which is in this case divided into um, ecological, cultural, social, economic, and also production ethics dimensions. Normally that would be a very political dimension. Or the French perspectives that in my reading very rightly so point out this very limited surface of sustainable development marked here as DD, that where social, ecological, and economical dimensions meet. And of course, all of these are um, embedded into a cultural dimension and of course, uh, as, as an overall um, context, political ethics play an important role. Whatever conceptualization applies to in the regional or national context where you might work or whatever normative uh, prescriptions in curricular document exist. I always liked to use um, this analytical model of, of Jörg Tremel 
a philosopher who carried out a analytical work based on a great variety of international conceptualizations of sustainable development and basically brought together the two traditional strands of conceptualization around sustainable development, namely on the one hand, this division discourse around three to five to six dimensions of sustainable development, in his case, ecological, social, and financial. And the other strand originating from the Brundtland report that uh, points out the necessity of taking care of future generations in terms of, of an intergenerational equity, and of course also the intragenerational equity or global equity concerning all of us alive at this moment, um, populating the different countries and continents of this planet. Now, this one aspect is a crucial and important because education for sustainable development to a certain extent thinks of sustainable development as set existing and core content in the curricula, but not necessarily prescribes it in any way as content dimension, either in teacher training or in um, the context of school curricula. So it is really crucial to, to reflect on what kind of concept of sustainable development in that particular country can we teach, or uh, is it is it useful to teach in that context, an issue that's um, in the community of geography educators quite often overseen as we think that it's always there so we can hit the ground running because we we meet clear concepts. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case in many situations. Now, apart from the conceptual framework, the second perspective and way of looking at the interconnectedness between geographical knowledge and a sustainable development is to break it down to curricular architecture elements that are the most contested and most widely discussed. And um, let's just say it's fair to say the ones that different stakeholders fight about quite a lot. So they are very contested, namely the content, the educational content of the curricula as a specific element of subject specific knowledge on the one hand, and on the other hand, the so-called ESD topics, so topic elements that are particularly important for uh, the education for sustainable development objectives. And I would like to use this content and topics discourse to, to take you into more specific elements of the interconnectedness between education for sustainable development and the acquisition of geographical knowledge based on some earlier work that I carried out and that um, is currently being revisited based on a curricular reform in the selected countries, namely a mixed methods analysis that I carried out in 2013 and now in 2020 as well, analyzing three selected countries um, from three areas of the globe that the United Nations still likes to consider existing, first, second, and third world, although they are not labeled as such in the mentality of the former socialist, former colonial, and the developed countries still persists in the documents and statistics of the international bodies as such. So I followed from these three areas, uh, selecting three case studies, um, an, an approach for lower secondary education, which is mandatory in the majority of the countries, the analysis of all subject curricula from three countries based on 46 ESD topics. Now these 46 ESD topics originate from documents that most governments signed and ratified ever since the 1992 Rio summit and during the different subsequent global events where such declarations were ratified. So we're not talking about very fashionable and new topics that couldn't have made their ways into curricula in a very short, within a very short period of time. We are talking about core issues of humanity as unfortunately this is in German, but you probably in the majority of you can see them because there is, for example, governance atmosphere, climate change, desertification, vulnerability, oceans, international collaboration, raw materials, water, 
biotechnology, protection, um, hunger, cultural diversity, north, south, and such. So quite a few topics, energy, quite a few topics that are very important to, to humanity. And it's fair to say that they will probably be very important in the future as well because they are connected to basic functions of our body many of them that we can survive as individuals and as a species and what i did in this study is to draw a line between subject specific knowledge and sustainable development now those of you who consider those two being the same uh, please bear with me um, and um, reflect maybe with me on why I consider that there is a little bit more to this. This figure shows the distribution of ESD topics across three geography curricula. And in all three case studies, as you can see, this is a colorful figure because the three geography curricula address the individual ESD topics in different ways. Meaning every time when there is the red color, the curricula limit the discussion of the topic exclusively to subject specific knowledge. Whenever there is a green color, education for sustainable development is the only perspective and the topic is kind of an add on completely detached from the content of the geography curriculum. It's a must have to comply with the objectives of sustainable development. And whenever there is a blue color, that means that students first acquire deep geographical knowledge or geographical knowledge uh, in the area of that topic and can build education for sustainable development related aspects on top of that using that deep knowledge. So for example, agriculture in Romania is something at the level of uh, declarative knowledge. What kind of agriculture types do we have? and uh, how are they distributed across the wor world, how do they work, what are the repercussions for commerce, for example, whereas the Bavarian case study places agriculture into a broader context of sustainable development and um, explores it within the framework of a concept of sustainable development based on the deep geographical knowledge already acquired in the discipline. If you took an example from physics, for example, physics deals with energy as a specific topic of its core knowledge. What kind of forms of energy do we know? How can you turn one form of energy into another one? How can you store energy? What are the technical possibilities? What are the drawbacks of the different solutions? So basically deep knowledge based on which you can reflect on aspects of sustainable development along the lines of developing more efficient ways of store, um, storing energy or transforming energy or producing energy. What is there? What is the knowledge that has been achieved? And how does this relate to the huge expectations um, currently being demanded and formulated in uh, societies uh, across the world? Now, as you can see that dealing with these topics is quite diverse and um, as a consequence, the way we attach education for sustainable development based on topics to the core topics of our discipline is quite heterogeneous. And this is a very important aspect of the success of ESD implementation. And in fact, of the interconnectedness between subject components and social education components of the curricula, speaking with Marston. Now, the individual curricula, if you looked at the topics, um, we achieve almost 30 of the 46 topics across the, the curricula, never more. And this is, so to say, the curricular surface that is occupied by these topics. And as you can see, not many of the subjects and not quite extensively contribute to discussing education for sustainable development in terms of, um, of topics, relevant topics, so largely connected to the structure of the individual school subject. Geography being, of course, one of the most um, most intensive contributors, also biology or technological subjects for that matter. Now, the third dimension that I would like to address is the one of the disciplinary knowledge or geographical knowledge. 
we have taken a look uh, into conceptualizations of sustainable development. We have taken a look at ESD topics and content as particular elements of a curricular architecture that could foster sustainable development and education for sustainable development. Let's take a look at how really geographical knowledge and disciplinary knowledge is being defined in relation to sustainable development. And I would like to use two case studies to do that. One is the Mexican case study. The Mexican curriculum and its definition, the definition of geographical knowledge in the Mexican curriculum rests on the very concept of geographical space, which is in the middle of this figure. And it uses as equally important components or concepts natural, political, economic, cultural, and social components. Now, if you look back on um, the usual conceptualizations of sustainable development in Latin America, not only dividing into economic, ecological, and social aspects, but also considering the cultural and political dimension, uh, it becomes very obvious that the very concept of sustainable development moved into the heart of geographical knowledge in secondary Mexican geography education. So we have here a case where geographical knowledge is to a great extent equated to what sustainable development can mean. And there are many people who actually consider this being an okay and very good solution. The curriculum also offers quite detailed content and guiding for teachers how they can teach these concepts and when they do so they really go beyond the limits of sustainable development it is a starting point sustainable development is important but they add different layers by means of content and very clear instructions and looking into the formats of teacher training which are um, challenging in a mexican content context considering the training in the school subjects, it is um, very important to have such guidelines uh, for teachers who uh, focus more strongly on pedagogy instead of being um, really explicitly trained in their subjects, primarily in their subjects. The German case study, um, which we really cannot talk about because of the federal educational system, but for the German case study here, the curriculum of Berlin places acting geographically at the core of uh, geographical knowledge, which is problematic already at the beginning because um, such a curriculum refers to knowledge that doesn't lead to acting in any kind of way and isn't applicable in the here and now and for my everyday reality is basically worthless and not part of this curriculum. The second huge challenge is as you can see, these um, concepts, so basically the competence areas of this curriculum, reduce subject-specific knowledge into decode systems. And as this curriculum um, competence model really shows, subject-specific knowledge, which isn't even called as such, it's called decode systems, uh, achieves the same importance and um, amount as the other competence areas, which are really generic competences such as passing judgment, communicate, applying methods, and maybe orientating oneself is more specific to geography. It becomes uh, an even more alarming when looking into the key concepts and uh, the definition of geographical knowledge underlying this curriculum. And this one originates from the German educational standards, which progressively, as the work of Schoeps has shown, have been implemented into the federal, into the regional curricula, so to say, the state curricula of the German Länder, one by one. And it's a very normative way of understanding geographical knowledge decided as such at the table. Geographical knowledge means, on the one hand, human environmental uh, systems, so we act as if there was a physical geographical subsystem, a human geographical subsystem, and they connect along concepts such as scale from the local to the global and system components from the structure towards the process. 
Now, such a systemic perspective and view of space and geography is certainly very useful for the objectives of sustainable development. It fits into a geography that looks for the system, that focuses on the system and that perceives reality as completely systemic and uh, explainable and livable in terms of, of a system. That's fine. However, perceived space, except for a little and few exceptions, is hardly part of this curriculum. Perceived aspects of sustainability, for example, and how I perceive them um, concerning their impact on my life and the life of others, are missing from this curriculum. Similarly, constructed spaces, and I took this example because in 2020, this is what really is in the media when we talk about dangerous spaces and dangerous groups of people that we see every now, every day in um, as an announcement of the police the search for individuals of a certain group who make subway stations for example during nighttime uh, through aggression uh, unaccessible and as dangerous places such perspectives have little place in such a curriculum only focused on the system. And of course, add to that arbitrary and minimal content in a time when teachers are demanding clear prescriptions and willingly are giving up their intellectual freedom and professional freedom to shape actually curricula. And add to that a curriculum that overemphasizes everyday experiences and the applicable, the useful for the here and now. So what does all this mean using a very specific example for teacher training where ESD and geographical knowledge inter, interconnect? One of the a few vignettes of the GeoCapabilities project that uh, really exhibit powerful disciplinary knowledge and are useful for the context of education for sustainable development is the one designed by Duncan Hawley based on a mini essay of Doreen Massey. Those of you who are not familiar with this vignette, which can be found on GeoCapabilities homepage, basically what this vignette aims at is to question whether the United Kingdom can be considered as one of the good guys thinking about climate change and greenhouse greenhouse emissions because the United Kingdom has such low values compared to the United States and uh, China. The vignette goes into detail of speaking about how industrial production in the United Kingdom uh, decreased and import from other countries, for example, from the United States, but mainly from China, substituted this internal industrial production, whereas the emphasis one was placed on a financial market with devastating consequences for the global markets and not only as we know from the development of the last decade and so. Now what he, here is being pointed out is an interconnectedness between powerful disciplinary knowledge and education for sustainable development. And Anke Uhlenwinkel took, took this example one step further and she has taken a look at Germany, one of the countries that traditionally exports also quite a number of goods. And if you preserve the bar chart above, expressing or showing the export um, of China and um, Germany in 2012 in billion euros, then you see that there is not a huge difference. And also the map sketch uh, the cartogram on the, on the below shows this interconnectedness based on different types of products that are being interchanged between China and Germany. And what becomes painfully obvious is that a lot of products that require heavy industrial production, intensive in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions, are taking place in Germany and these products are being shipped to China. If we compare, of course, the United Kingdom uh, on the left-hand side to Germany on the right-hand side, then you can see that the trend is very similar. Uh, there is um, 
of course, uh, an increasing dimension of the commerce, but Germany has become and always has been an export nation in um, after the Second World War, where import is a little bit, a um, little bit decreasing, as opposed to the United Kingdom, where export has been significantly decreasing. Please also note the amount of um, exported and in, uh, imported goods in uh, euros, which is, of course, a huge difference between Germany and uh, the United Kingdom. So Germany, to a certain extent compared to China, has a very active industrial production. Still, carbon di dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions in Germany, as opposed to China, have been continuously decreasing and have better and better values across the decades as, as opposed to China. So for purposes of education for sustainable development, of course, this knowledge, this very structure of industrial production, the processes of production in Germany as opposed to China, the markets, the interconnectedness, import versus export in China and in Germany are crucial to actually pass judgment on how sustainable these economies are. And actually, persons such as uh, Luisa Neubauer um, would be well advised to look into such dimensions before um, claiming publicly that uh, over the last 16 years, the German chancellor hasn't achieved any kind of success in terms of climate change. So this is one good example that we could use in the context of teacher training for education for sustainable development. And I'm really happy to talk about this example with you within um, the symposium and uh, also by email or any other format. So summing it up, what Sally and uh, I wanted to contribute to this um, workshop is um, twofold. On the one hand, I would like to add to this extensive debate on powerful knowledge, powerful disciplinary knowledge and powerful geography, so to say the forgotten element, that there is a world outside geography and there is a world outside of geographical knowledge and geographical knowledge is not free from all these processes. Namely, there is one world concerning how we deal with knowledge in formal education. So that there is an increasing contingency of content, that there is a growing emphasis on cross-disciplinary skills at the expense of subject-specific skills or subject specificity, that there is more procedural and tacit knowledge in the curricula, it's old news. Geography may be discovering all of this in a self-referential system, note that Papers published, for example, in the Journal of Geography in Higher Education up until the late 1990s have not contained one single reference from outside of geography, talking about parochial. This all is something that has been discussed about, and this is all something that concerns all subjects. We are not alone, and we would be very much better advised to look at other subjects, how they dealt with this, what concepts did they use, and what progress have they achieved. So far, we have been too much focused on ourselves and on importing Michael Young and Johann Müller's concepts into geography, not really looking to, to the right and to the left. That's definitely an objective to be achieved because we could only gain based on that. And the second dimension is, it concerns our academic discipline of geography, namely knowledge in geographical research decreases just as fast as in physics, or as we have seen in this historical year of um, the COVID pandemics, knowledge on the COVID devaluates rapidly as opposed to what we knew in March our knowledge base is much stronger now in November. And this is the, the regular way how scientific progress works. This is something we have to expose our students to. But we, of course, have to acknowledge that not even us academics can always keep up with this fast knowledge production and devaluation in our 
respective academic disciplines that we use as a knowledge and expert base, so the discourse in powerful geographical knowledge. So how do we expect from geography teachers to actually follow the deepest possible knowledge from all these fields of geography that are producing both in disciplinary and in interdisciplinary contexts a huge variety of new knowledge? We have to reflect on this. This is a key element when formulating criticism at the address of teachers who don't manage to achieve a curriculum that can be judged from a very academic perspective as something uh, standing in for a suitable, powerful disciplinary knowledge. Second, let's not forget that there are new, novel ways of accumulating and storing knowledge. And they have been shifting over the last years. Think about your social media, your academia.edu, or your ResearchGate profiles, whatever you publish on your homepage, over which channels you talk to, to your peers. All these are new ways of accumulating, storing, and distributing knowledge. And they also mean novel ways of access to knowledge for different communities. So there is much more knowledge out there. There is much more to be read, much more to be evaluated as suitable or not. So it's not an easy issue revolving around the very way how knowledge is being generated, produced, dealt with, stored, passed on, and accessed. And I think in the context of powerful geographical knowledge and disciplinary knowledge, this very dimension of the speed of uh, change needs to be addressed as well. And in my view, this very important aspect has been as, uh, absent from the debate, from the core of the debate. And it really is required to ground the discourse for the purposes of teacher training and to actually be able to, to achieve a significant progress, um, um, not stating that what has been achieved uh, this far uh, cannot be considered as a progress. So yes, uh, we can all see that school subjects are losing their core by undergoing a process of loss of disciplinarity or de-disciplinarization. This is something that we can see and um, to different extent across the world is also valid observation to what extent um, equating geography and school geography to education for sustainable development can stand for such a disciplinarization is one of the objectives of this symposium. And I strongly stand in for removing the equation um, between um, powerful geographical knowledge and sustainable development in contrast to Rosalind McKeown already 2007 stated that geography could claim sustainable development as its own. The story is not that simple. So instead of concluding, Sally and I would like to pose here a couple of central questions that we would like to explore with you. First, how can we deal with the new formats of knowledge production, storage, and distribution in teacher training? Second, how can we attach ESD and other objectival educations to deep expert knowledge? What has been done so far? What are the success stories? What should be done differently? Third, how do we deal with the increasing normativity of formal education? Because education for sustainable development is highly normative, and if not done correctly, extremely anti-democratic. Fourth, how do we get back to deep expert knowledge instead of ethics and moral? Anke Ullenwinkel, among others, pointed out that geography educators seem to have thrown out their subject-specific knowledge and uh, replaced it by discourses only revolving around ethics and moral. As we know, these are important dimensions in the school teaching, but um, scientific standards of knowledge production have a slightly different view on the role of ethics and morals in this context. So we definitely need to address this issue as well. Fifth, what kind of knowledge drives the disciplinarization of new subjects? Because in so many countries around the world, 
we have actually compound subjects such as social studies where geography is just a small part often reduced to topography and where lies what is there really a subject specific knowledge to these compound subjects current research shows that not being the case sustainable development understood as the core of geography within a subject dedicated to social studies of society probably will not bring the game to this subject that those interested in increasing the number of weekly hours and doing the lobby work for this subject not to disappear from the curricula um, they probably will not achieve this within such compound subjects that mainly dropped all physical geographical content and all the ecological dimensions, so to say. And sixth, what support do we need to acquire deep subject specific knowledge? What educational materials, what kind of learning aids, what kind of training formats do we need? We'll look forward to discussing these topics with you. So thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for having us.